Okay, so this lecture is going to start our foray into um, looking at atoms and the way that matter is arranged, which is really the whole point of chemistry after all. We're going to start with just an introduction of some of the things we know to be true about chemistry, some of the basic laws um, that we'll refer back to all year long. Um, the first one is called the Law of Conservation of Mass, and this is a um, theorem that states that in any chemical reaction, there may be a change in mass of the substances that you started with and the substances that you end with. But what is not changed is the total amount of mass that exists within the reaction. So the statement itself is, mass is neither created nor destroyed in a reaction, but it can often be transformed. Um, the big implications of this law, which are really kind of amazing to think about, is that all matter on Earth has been here since the first moment um, this planet was created however that may have been, and all matter on Earth will continue to be here until such time that the planet ceases to exist, when and if that ever happens. So the oxygen that you're breathing in now was likely breathed in by dinosaurs 67 million years ago. The water that we have in the ocean has been in glaciers, it's been in icebergs, it's been in sugars, it's been in plants, it's been in any number of other places. Um, whenever we have a chemical reaction, while it may appear that something new is created, the matter that went into that new object has always been here. We're not creating new matter in chemical reactions, nor are we ever permanently destroying matter. So this is a really big idea in chemistry. These other two laws look at the arrangement of matter when forming compounds. So the first law looks at um, chemical compounds and the ways that elements combine, and it says that there is a definite proportion or there is a, an equal ratio of elements in every compound of a certain type. So for instance, water. In every molecule of water, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. It doesn't matter if you're looking at the entire Pacific Ocean. Every single molecule of water has two hydrogens and one oxygen. Or if you're looking at a raindrop, <clears throat> pardon me, whether it's big or small, whether it's from the ocean or a cloud, whether it's from your faucet or a river. All water has two hydrogens and one oxygen. All compounds will always have the same ratio of elements. That's what makes them a unique compound. Um, the second law that looks at proportion is the law of multiple proportions. And what this one is saying is there are lots of different ways that elements can combine. So you learned about sugars last year in biology and you learned that um, sugars always have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But there are tons of different kinds of sugars. However, each sugar has a ratio, just like we said in the law of definite proportions, each sugar has a ratio that's unique to itself. So in this case, this is glucose, and over here we have sucrose, which is table sugar. Right? They both have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They both have ratios, 6 to 12 to 6, or 12 to 22 to 11, but the ratio doesn't change, and the ratio is always a whole number. What that means is you can't have 12 carbons and only 21 and a half hydrogens. There is no half of an atom of something or another. The ratios are always whole numbers, and that's an important detail we'll come back to later on this year. Um, so we're going to start talking about atoms themselves and what we know to be true about atoms and how we've learned some of the information that we've learned. Um, a lot of the early work um, with the subparticles or the parts that go into making up an atom was done by a gentleman named John Dalton. He was a British scientist and he was doing um, a lot of his studies in the early part of the 19th century. And he put together kind of a compilation of all of the best wisdom and knowledge up to that point, and he called it um, the atomic theory. So many of the parts of his theory are still, hundreds of years later, known to be true. However, some of them um, he wasn't quite right on. So um, the first thing he said was that elements are made up of tiny particles called atoms, 
which is in fact true. He said that all atoms of an element are identical, so all carbon atoms look exactly like all other carbon atoms, and all carbon atoms look different from all other atoms. So carbon does not look like oxygen, and hydrogen does not look like helium. They may have similar characteristics, but their atoms are slightly different. It's sort of like you have um, characteristics similar to the other people in the room, but your fingerprints are different. Same thing with atoms. Um, he said that atoms of different elements can combine to form compounds, which we know to be true. And um, this information has given rise to the laws that we talked about just a moment ago. And then um, the final one is that atoms are not created or destroyed in reactions, but merely rearranged. So this might be in terms of mass. It might be in terms of other physical properties. Um, but regardless, we know that new atoms are not being created when we do work in the science lab, and we are not permanently destroying any atoms um, by the reactions that we cause to take place. Um, some of the other information that we know about atoms came in the couple of centuries after Dalton was doing his work. So about 100 years after Dalton's um, atomic theory was published, another British gentleman named J.J. Thompson, I'm pretty sure he was British, um, he did some work with a, an experiment that he designed called the cathode ray. And so what it looks like basically is this picture you see below. There's a glass um, cylindrical shaped tube and he ran gases at fairly low pressure through these gas tubes, glass tubes, pardon me. He filled each tube with gas and then what he did was he hooked up this um, electrical current, and so that's what you see here. Um, he had the positive um, electrode at one end and the negative electrode at the other, and then he turned it on. And so he caused there to be a charge difference moving through these gases. And what he found every single time, regardless of the type of gas that he used, was this ray, he called it a cathode ray, was produced. So he got this bright beam of light, sort of like what you might imagine a laser to look like. He got this bright beam of light that went through the tube horizontally. And so what he did next was um, he added a magnet to the equation and he put a negatively charged end of one magnet on the outside of the glass and the positively charged end um, on the opposite side of the glass. He kept them pretty um, aligned to um, remove that variable. And what he found, once again, every single time, regardless of the type of gas, was that this cathode ray bent up towards the positive magnet. It never went toward the negative. And so operating on the principle that I'm sure you have heard in other places, opposites attract, he drew the conclusion that this ray of light must be made up of negatively charged particles, right? The negatively charged particles were attracted to the positively charged magnet. And as a consequence, he called those particles electrons, Electr that this prefix uh, refers to a negative charge or a negative anything, really. So he called the particles in this ray of light electrons. And that was really the first information that we had about um, different charges within an atom. Shortly after um, the Thomson experiments, he developed a model that he called plum pudding. That's right. That's how I know he was British because plum pudding is a very common British dessert. And what it has is basically, you know, think of any kind of pudding and it's suspended within it are tiny little plums. So he said that in his view and based on the data he had collected, the um, atom of any kind of gas or any other element probably looked something like a bowl of plum pudding. It has this kind of, you know, spherical shape, and it's a mostly positive substance that has these tiny little negatively charged electrons interspersed without. So when he added electricity to this plum pudding, um, the positive and negative charges separated from one another, 
And because he, he assumed that the negatively charged electrons, this is my abbreviation for electron, E with a little negative sign, he assumed that the negatively charged electrons must be quite small because they separated out from the positively charged um, whatever else was in that model, the positively charged particles, and they formed this beam that could easily be bent based on the location of a positive magnet. So he said the electrons were probably interspersed all throughout the plum pudding of the atom, um, but they must not weigh very much because they could easily be manipulated and moved around. Um, about a decade after he was kind of widely recognized for this model, a gentleman named Milliken, who was an American scientist, um, did some calculations and found the actual mass of an electron, which is 9.109 .09 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. That is ridiculously small. Um, and I'm going to give you a comparison here in just a minute when we talk about the positive particles that make up this model. So... Um, just shortly after this is all kind of happening in the same 20 or 30 year time span, all over the world scientists are doing experiments to try to learn more about the atom. This gentleman, Ernest Rutherford, was from New Zealand, um, and he gets most of the credit for this experiment, though there were some others, Geiger, who you maybe have heard of the Geiger counter, and Marsden, um, who contributed as well. But his experiment was set up like the picture you see here. He used um, this device here, it's called an alpha particle emitter. Alpha particles are heavy and they are positively charged. Um, and so he used a device that could shoot these rays, kind of laser rays of positive alpha particles. And he shot them at a piece of gold foil, that's what you see here, which is sort of like a piece of aluminum foil, only it's made of gold rather than aluminum. So he set up this sheet of gold foil and he fired these alpha rays at the foil to see what would happen. In most cases, in nearly all cases, the um, alpha rays were heavy enough that they passed directly through the foil. And he kind of, he had this screen set up all around so he could see where they hit, where they landed after they went through. But what you'll see here as the rays didn't pass directly straight through. They didn't go through the middle and continue on in a straight line. So they must have bounced off of something. He was trying to figure out what that something was. And he was stunned to find that some of the alpha rays actually bounced almost directly straight back at the um, emitter itself. And so what that told him was there had to be these large positive particles somewhere within the gold foil that were hitting, directly hitting the alpha particles and causing them to bounce back. Remember, opposites attract. So if this was a negatively charged particle and you fired this positively charged alpha ray at it, they'd be attracted, they'd stick together. But instead, the alpha particle was hitting it and then bouncing off. So that told him this must be a positively charged particle and it must also be pretty large and pretty heavy in order to bounce these heavy alpha rays directly back. So he called these heavy particles protons, and he said they've got to be pretty close to um, the center. They've got to be kind of centrally located near one another um, and able to bounce back these large alpha particles. So he posited or he hypothesized that they were stored in the nucleus or the center of the atom. So it would look something like this. Let's say we have protons all kind of wedged together in the nucleus, and then our atom is some larger size out here. The thing that's interesting, I told you we would talk a little bit about mass again. So, oh, that's not what I want to do. That's weird. I wonder how I move the whole thing. Let's see. Nope, not like that. Hmm, interesting. Um, the interesting thing about this is that when you compare a proton to an electron, Right, if we're doing a um, unit analysis or a conversion ratio, a proton weighs about as much, in a real life example, as an African elephant would if an electron were the size of a guinea pig. That's the mass ratio. One electron is about as much as one guinea pig compared to a proton, which would weigh about as much as one African elephant. That's a huge disparity. 
So then um, the last kind of information that we have learned about the structure of the nucleus, or pardon me, the structure of an atom and the nucleus within that atom, if I scoot this for just a second, we know that there are in fact positive protons all throughout this nucleus. And we know that there are negative electrons that are floating around out here near-ish the nucleus, but not right on top of the protons. What we have since also learned is that there is a third particle type called a neutron, and it has that name, nu for neutral. Neutrons are also found in the nucleus. This is our nucleus. And they have no charge whatsoever but they are very heavy. They're just slightly heavier than a proton, significantly heavier than electrons. Because the number of protons within the nucleus is always equal to the number of electrons outside the nucleus, right? these are positive, these are negative, those charges balance each other out. So the total charge of an atom is zero. It has no charge whatsoever. It's neutral because its charged particles are equal. There's an equivalent number of both. Um, so what you should be taking away from this is that the nucleus housing the protons and the electrons is responsible for the bulk of the mass of the atom. Electrons basically contribute nothing to the total mass of the atom, but the electrons make up a lot of the volume of an atom because they're kind of buzzing around outside um, the nucleus and they have pretty random motion, which we'll be talking more about, um, but their movement takes up a lot of space. And so it makes the volume of the atom dependent upon the number of electrons that are out there and how much motion each one is showing. And that is it for today. So I would like you to come to class with three discussion questions. Make sure you include the question in the questions column of your Cornell notes. And um, you should have a three to five sentence summary on the highlights and big ideas of this topic. Thanks very much.